Thank you for joining us. My name is Joe Carr, and I'm happy to welcome you to the Providence College Podcast. We're joined today by accountancy professor Steve Peralt, a PC faculty member since 2013. Steve has been recognized with Providence College School of Business Awards for both his teaching and his research. We talked about both those subjects and those aspects of scholarly life, including his research projects involving whistleblower reporting decisions, also the things that sparked his interest in this academic specialty. Not only that, but he's the second Hendrickson grad on the PC podcast in the past six weeks. Welcome, Steve. Hi, Joe. So it's uh, fun to have you along with Brian Lamoureux, uh, local people who have made their way to the PC School of Business faculty. Uh, tell us a, a little bit about your pathway to, to this part of your life. Yeah, um, I actually, I, I grew up local. I grew up in a town that's about uh, 10 miles south of Providence. Um, and so uh, I was always familiar with Providence College growing up. Uh, mostly from following the basketball team. Uh, but, uh, you know, I grew up here. Uh, I went off to high school. Um, and when I graduated from high school, I, I really wasn't wasn't super sure what I wanted to do with my life, like I guess a, lo- a lot of kids are. Um, but I thought that getting a, a liberal arts education um, would, would be something that would make me more well-rounded and also might give me an opportunity to try and figure that out. So um, at the time, I wanted to be far away from home, so I didn't consider PC. Uh, I, uh, I ended up at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., um, and I spent uh, a year there taking courses in history and, and philosophy and uh, psychology, um, and it was a great experience. Um, and um, eventually, I'm in my sophomore year of college, and I've got to choose a major. And uh, this is this is the late '90s, so the dot com boom is going on, and companies are having IPOs left and right, and uh, the Nasdaq is at its all time high. And you know, these these finance and accounting professionals are kind of rock stars in a way. And I thought, huh, you know, and and I had taken courses in economics and I had done pretty well. And and I decided that uh, I was going to give that a shot. And and a few years later, I had an accounting degree. Um, But, uh, you know, what's interesting, though, is when I think about um, the type of skills I use on a day to day basis. So, you know, critical thinking, being an effective writer. um, A lot of times it's those skills that that uh, that I picked up in those early liberal arts courses uh, that I actually end up using the most, not the ones that I picked up in the, in the technical accounting and finance courses afterwards. So, um, so I think that's probably something that sets our PC grads apart, too, is they have that, that rigorous grounding in the liberal arts, but also the technical skills as well. So that's something I've come to value. If you bring that line of thinking to the present day, does that flavor the way you teach? Because you know that your students are also involved in development of Western Civ, and they're taking history courses and, and having the same kind of experience you had as an undergraduate? Absolutely. And it keeps me on my game a bit, too, because, uh, you know, knowing the kind of education they're getting up in upper campus, um, I need to make sure that I'm, I'm you know, doing service to that. And so uh, so very much. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so, so we're kind of a unique place in that regard, that our students are expected to be very well-rounded, uh, even though they may be in a discipline that, that's seen as somehow being quite technical uh, and not well-rounded. Um, that's not the case here at PC. What are your observations of the way that people who uh, have this type of educational background behave in the workplace? What do you see in terms of people who are able to exercise those same kinds of skills that you mentioned, critical thinking and so forth? What impact does that have when they are in the workforce? You really, to be successful as an accountant, need to be well-rounded. I think, um, you know, it's still the case that many times, you know, freshmen who are taking their first accounting course... um, even in 2018, there's still this perception that the accountant is the solitary individual, you know, who doesn't like to talk to people and just wants to go in and do his job and go home every day. Green eye shade. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, the green visor. Right. Um, and uh, boy, you know, th- that is just not the way the profession is anymore. You know, uh, our the accounting profession now is going through an enormous amount of change in terms of uh, technology and access to to data, um, and investors and regulators want higher quality information. They want it to be more accurate, and they want it more timely, uh, and we've got to figure out how to get that to them. Um, and so this is no longer a profession for individuals who don't like change and who don't like to think on their feet and aren't, aren't good critical thinkers. Um, uh, maybe that was 30 years ago, but it certainly isn't the case anymore now. So, so that's something that we tell our students, that uh, you know, the, the, the liberal arts education is something that's really going to pay dividends in, the future, in their future careers as accountants. Can we shift slightly to the subject of technology? It's Mm -hmm. something that's uh, front and center in your teaching and your research. When I asked you as we were preparing what kinds of podcasts you listened to, the first Mm -hmm. category you mentioned was tech. Mm -hmm. Uh, How does a deep knowledge of technology uh, affect how you're able to effectively teach these students and prepare them for the types of careers and and, uh, work lives that they 
are likely to have? Well, uh, you know, we try to do that in two ways. Uh, first of all, we need to keep ourselves familiar with what, what the tools are. You know, um, one, of the, one of the big issues that we're grappling with now is we have access to, to so much accounting data. What do we do with that data and how do we, how do we learn interesting things from that data? Um, and so, you know, for example, I teach a class now in data analytics where, you know, our students are, are being provided with very large data sets and using programming language like Python in order to find uh, interesting interesting insights from those data sets. Um, but also, you know, a larger question is, you know, um, beyond the technical skills, uh, you know, how, um, how do we ask interesting questions of data, you know, um, which, is, which is a very different, different issue. That's not one that requires necessarily technical expertise. It requires the ability to think uh, big picture about a problem, right? Data is just a tool, right? Um, but a tool without a purpose isn't a very much use. And so um, so it's it's kind of a delicate balance between doing the, the technical training, but also the big picture training as well. There's some associated peril, right? Especially when we're dealing with corporate finances or any kind of finances and the availability to, of data in various formats and the ways that people can manipulate it and move it around. Oh, exactly. And, uh, and making sure that it's secure, especially if it's sensitive information that others might not have access to. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's a huge issue. Um, and it's, it's, it's really something that the profession as a whole is grappling with. And we at PC are, are, are trying to stay on top of that. What kind of a person do you see when you look out into the classroom these days? People who are, let's focus on accounting majors, folks who are interested in pursuing these careers directly. What uh, piques their interest? What uh, motivates their curiosity about these subjects? Accounting is an interesting discipline in that um, the job outlook for accountants is, is generally relatively strong. Um, but the interest in the major tends to go in cycles. Uh, when the economy is not so strong, we get a lot of accounting majors who choose the major because of the stability. And when the economy, economy is relatively strong, like it is now, um, you know, that tends to change a little bit. And so I would say now we tend to have a lot of students who are really interested and passionate about either accounting or finance. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, tend to have, they tend to have quantitative aptitude. Um, but they also, I think, are, are generally intellectually curious. Um, and so um, someone who is a good public speaker, someone who is a good writer, and someone who has quantitative ability, um, that's, that's, that's kind of uh, some really good characteristics that, that you'd like to see in an accounting student. And, and generally, that's what, our, that's what our students have, I find. Let's talk a bit about your research. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of projects relate to whistleblower behavior. Mm -hmm. a really interesting uh, subject area. How did you narrow in and focus in on that subject area for this kind of, these kinds of studies? Yeah, well, before I, I went back into academia, I worked as a uh, financial auditor. And so I've always been interested professionally in considering things that we can do to increase the likelihood that whistleblowers will speak up. You know, if you think of many of the kind of major recent financial frauds, you know, the Mer Bernie Madoffs, for example, um, many times it's the case that the reason why these frauds are uncovered is because someone sees something and they decide to speak up. But we know many times that when individuals see something, they often don't choose to say anything. And so I'm very interested in looking at ways to, to try and figure out why that happens and things we can do to make people more comfortable blowing the whistle. One of the projects relates to the, the language, uh, hotline language specifically. Can you take us through that and what you've studied and what you've learned? Yeah, so um, one of the earliest things that one of my colleagues, uh, James Weinberg from Florida Atlantic University and I decided to look at was um, the language that organizations use to promote their internal whistleblower hotlines. Uh, you know, most, most organizations have a whistleblower or an ethics hotline where employees can can report uh, if they see something that they think might be unethical. Um, and so we started looking at these hotline policies. Um, and we know that one of the main reasons why whistleblowers don't report is because they often fear that they're going to be retaliated against. And, and it's definitely true that whistleblower retaliation does exist. And, and so in order to, to reassure whistleblowers that if they report, they won't be retaliated against, uh, most, most companies try to uh, provide these very specific assurances to them. And so just uh, as an example, uh, one of the policies we looked at, and I'm reading here, said, you'll be protected from threatening behavior, harassment, loss of job or promotion, and other forms of professional, personal, or financial forms of retaliation. And that sounds very well and good. At face value, that, that seems okay. But... Um, what we found is that when exposed to a very explicit policy like that, investors are, are, excuse me, whistleblowers actually feel like the risk of reporting is greater and indicate that they're actually 
less likely to report, um, which is contrary to what the purpose of those stated descriptions are. Um, and so what we determined is that you want to be very careful in how you perform, uh, inform a potential whistleblower that they will be protected. Um, you know, a simple reminder that protections exist is probably good enough, but you know, explicitly then assuring them against any form of retaliation that you can think of, um, that's probably not going to have the intended effect that you want. What's your theory about why that is the uh, protesting too much? Is that what it comes down to? Well, it, it, it makes the retaliation available in the minds of potential whistleblowers. Um, you know, I, I make the analogy sometimes to going through TSA at the airport, right? Um, you know, you know, we see that, you know, the body scans and, and the bags need to be scanned. And, and you would think that would make us feel protected and remind us that, statistically speaking, flying is, is pretty safe now. But, but what we find is actually that makes people feel that flying is more dangerous. Um, so I think a similar thing is going on in, in the whistleblower scenario. When, when we're reminded of retaliation, we think it's more likely to occur. Another project related to whistleblowers involves the... Uh availability of uh, monetary rewards for whistleblower um, acknowledgments. A different, a, pro, a different look at the same subject, but an, an, again, a very interesting outcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and so uh, so with this project, uh, again, again, uh, my colleague James Weinberg and another colleague, uh, Leslie Berger from Wilfrid Laurier University, um, we wanted to look at whether financial incentives or financial payments could be used to encourage whistleblower reporting. And this is actually something that the SEC does already. The IRS has an incentive program. The Department of Justice does as well. Um, and one of the things we know about the whistleblower reporting decision is that when whistleblowers speak up, they often do so because they feel they have a moral obligation to do so. Um, and so they say something because it's the right thing to do. Um, and so we were interested in learning whether that changes when one might receive a payment for speaking up. Um, and what we actually find is that when incentives are available, that actually crowds out the moral incentive to do the right thing. And so the decision frame changes from I'm going to report because I feel obligated to do so, but to now I'm going to report because I'm trying to maximize the financial benefit to me. And so we designed an experiment, and, and what we found was that uh, when incentives were available, whistleblowers were more likely to delay reporting to allow the fraud to go grow larger in size, so they would get a larger reward. And so they were delaying reporting more than if no incentives had been mentioned at all, which is really kind of counterintuitive. When Dean Maxfield, the dean of the School of Business, talks about the PC business education, one of the phrases she uses pretty regularly is ethical decision making. And it seems to me that in some way, both of these subjects, and certainly this general subject of whistleblower behavior, relates to that. In that sense, it really seems to fit within the Providence College brand and the way of uh, conducting the educational process here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, in accounting and especially auditing, uh, ethics are a part of everything that we do. Uh, you know, we're a in a position of having access to financial information that the general public doesn't have. And so the general public counts on us to report that information correctly um, and honestly. Um, and if we don't do that, to be quite frank, uh, we won't have jobs anymore, right? So, so, so trust is a big part of that, and ethics is certainly a part of that as well. Let's talk about the uh, scholarly life and research as part of that. Why is it important for professors to develop new knowledge and create um, research projects to find out things that are not previously known or to amplify knowledge that's out there already? Yeah, I mean, I think as professors, we have a responsibility to be on the cutting edge of our field. And I think the way that you make sure you're on the cutting edge is that you make sure you're involved in creating and generating new knowledge, right? Um, and so I think it's our responsibility to do that. Um, and to be quite honest, I, I can't tell you how many conversations I have in the classroom where we find something interesting in a particular research project, and then and then I share that with my students. Um, and, and to be quite frank, oftentimes they come up with insights that I maybe wouldn't have considered on my own, which is really interesting. And I guess selfishly as well, if I can convince some of them that this is an interesting option for your career, um, that would be a good thing too. But. It's interesting to think about it from the perspective of the, of the student too, because she or he is learning something that in some sense nobody else knows. And as students, perhaps none of us really appreciated that, but it's, it's a key component of a high level education. Right. And, and I almost, uh, I consider it kind of the hidden life of professors. I, most of our students, you know, don't always realize that 
a big portion of our job is, is conducting research and generating new knowledge and publishing. So I think to the extent that I can sort of demystify that aspect of the career, I think that's a good thing. In general, what would you say as we sort of wrap up this subject, Steve, uh, is what are some of the attributes that you're looking to impart to your students? What do you want PC accountancy graduates to leave here knowing in terms of the practice, but also understanding with respect to things like ethical behavior and, and the way that they should conduct ways they should conduct themselves after they leave and enter the workforce? Uh, you know, if I were to narrow it down to one thing, I'd like to uh, to have them leave here with, with sort of an intellectual curiosity, the ability to be lifelong learners, because the accounting profession is changing so dramatically right now that almost any technical skill we teach them is going to be out of date relatively quickly. Um, and so the technical skills are not necessarily what's important. It's the ability to learn on the fly, the ability to find a way to create your own value within your organization during a time of change, I think that's what's going to pay dividends in their career going forward. Let's talk a bit about the PC School of Business. This is your fifth year, so you've been here in a period of tremendous transition, came in just after Dean Maxfield uh, took over and the new building is in place. Boy, there's a lot of momentum around business education in the Providence College environment, isn't there? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that, and that was that was the reason why I chose PC. Um, you know, I could see that, uh, you know, the, the, the amount of energy and enthusiasm in this building, a lot of young new faculty, and there's just there's just a buzz around this place that 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 is really is really great. And you see it as soon as you walk in the door. And so um, it's been a great five years and, and it's been really a great place for me to call home. So you mentioned early uh, contact with PC coming through basketball. You still following the Friars? I do still follow the Friars, and they need they need one more win, uh, and so so hopefully, well, hopefully they'll win tomorrow against Xavier. But uh, but we'll right. see. I definitely am still a big fan of basketball. And fan, so. then on I mean, to the Big East tournament, and who the, knows what after that? Right? Then on to the Big East. Yep, yep. So that's all, it's it's very exciting. It yep. is. It's a lot of fun. So, <laughs> well, Steve Peralt, our guest, the accountancy professor here in the Providence College School of Business. This has been a lot of fun. We appreciate your time, and let's do this again sometime. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you for joining us today. You can subscribe to the Providence College podcast podcast at all the usual places and they're available on the college's YouTube channel. Feedback is welcome at podcast at providence.edu. Thanks to our producer, Chris Judge. I'm Joe Carr. Until next time.